This is a most uh, awkward uh, application here uh, of attempting to drill it because if you just drill it like this, first of all it might get caught and spun around, but secondly uh, it's, it's going to push like that. So that's why I don't like to do it this way, but if you want to do it that way you need to cut a piece of wood, a waste wood, temporary piece that's the exact thickness and have it in there so that you're drilling uh, through the uh, metal and the wood all at one time and this this doesn't uh, move on you so uh, so make one of those if you need to and you gotta take the time to do that and remember this project is supposed to be fun and takes several days you're not gonna do it all in one sitting so so do that accurately and, and uh, be careful it would you need some way to hold this too uh, that is a vice so and I'm not doing it that way and I'll show you the way that I'm going to do it I'm going to use my little Whitney Jensen punch for this and I've already changed the punches and put the 7 30 seconds punch into the, the punch along with the die. Remember the, this is the die and this is the punch. Uh, if you look at any one of these punches you're going to see that there's a little pilot on it, uh, almost like a little nipple on the end. And I like to get that started into the center punch hole. That's why I center punch it and you will feel that when you when you locate it when you move it around all of a sudden you'll feel that it's it's uh, that it's in the center punch mark and then you know that, that the hole is going to be where you want it to be now you may not have a set of these but they made millions of these uh, Whitney Jensen punches and they sure are handy to have around and there it is and I, I can feel that the tip of the punch is in the center punch mark and it's very soft material. Back it out and there it is and I'll do the other side off camera. The hole typically gets punched just a little bit oversized or maybe the tubing is uh, uh, you punch it undersized rather and the tubing tends to be a little bit oversized so naturally it doesn't go in there. So I'm going to take my 7 16 hand reamer and uh, ream that out and uh, if, it, if the tubing still does not go in there I will uh, cut this off and just polish it ever so lightly in the lathe uh, with some emery cloth so that it fits and also I want it polished and clean and the corrosion not corrosion the oxidation removed so that it's easy to solder now you can buy this at any hobby store, most uh, large hardware stores, and uh, this particular one came from a Hobby Lobby, but I had to buy a three pack of different sizes, but this was a little harder to find, the 730 seconds. My Ace hardware was out of it, and uh, they don't seem to bother to refill the, uh, the odd sizes. So I think it sets there too long and they don't make any money on it. And it didn't take much to ream that, and I ran it up. This is called line reaming. So when you line ream, you know that the two holes uh, are in alignment. And so the height, you know, on this side and on this side would be, would be exactly the same. You don't, you don't want it cockeyed, even one degree. And then also, looking at it from this way, it needs to be square. That's not as easily done as what you think, and that's why I'm taking so much time to explain how I did this, how I laid it out, how I uh, punched or drilled the holes so that that happens to you. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that uh, when you go to run the engine, the uh, main shaft here is not perpendicular to this shaft, and you're going to have binding, and if it's very far off, it will not look right. It it's just will look like it's sloppy uh, workmanship and all of this stuff has to be learned over a period of time just through uh, trial and error and uh, and experience and uh, don't get too discouraged if you are a little off but I'm telling you uh, the different methods to assure you that you don't uh, miss drill because then you got to start over and you already got quite a bit of time involved in this now here's the uh, the, the brass and uh, notice that it fits right in now it's a good fit. And I'm going to cut this off, and I always cut off a little bit uh, longer 
because it can be trimmed later on. So I'm going to cut it off that long. Now this isn't that easy to cut because it's so thin wall. So you need a fine tooth uh, blade or a little abrasive cutoff also works real well. This particular piece of brass from Hobby Lobby was annealed. It is very soft. I was doing some experimental bending here. Of course you see that it kinked so I, I got to cut that off and throw it away. But this is a soft brass compared to most of the brass that I uh, work with. I have another piece here. Well, I made a whistle out of that one, but the other brass is, uh, is tempered, much stiffer. I would prefer this, but this is what I'm dealing with. So I'll cut this off now, polish it just a little bit for soldering. Here's an ideal way to cut this off. Make sure you use jaw protectors, and these protectors even have a little V-way in them. And don't over tighten it or you'll collapse the tubing. Saw very close to the jaws so you don't bend it. And use one of these uh, cheap little hacksaws here with a very fine tooth blades. These are usually a 24 or 32 tooth. And I'm just about all the way through. Like that. And then I immediately take it to my little belt sander. Square up the end. Take the burr off and use your little uh, countersink to deburr the inside. Now I'll put it in the lathe and polish it for soldering purposes. Before I solder that uh, main bearing in, I've located this hole and that's to be eighth inch. Now that's the pivot hole for the cylinder. So it's going to be right on the center line there that I already laid out and then I found the center going this way which I believe was uh, uh, about 11, let's see, about 11, uh, 11 sixteenths from each side. I center punched it and now that's an eighth inch hole. You can drill that eighth inch or I'm going to use the punch again, and I'm fortunate enough to have several of these punches so that I do not have to change the punch every time, which is uh, uh, rather time consuming to change these punches. So I'll go ahead and punch that hole, and then uh, ream it eighth inch, if I have a reamer that small, and then that is done and located, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and solder in the main bearing. Boy, I like those punches. Probably just a little bit undersized. Now, regarding the main bearing, it's polished up. I can get it in there. Like that. Now, this is the flywheel side on this particular engine. Notice that the brass bearing was polished a little bit. So I want uh, one eighth of an inch to hang out here on the flywheel side. This is a lot more than I need and that will be trimmed when I determine how long I want it to be. But looking on the finished engine again, see we want about an eighth of an inch right in there so that the flywheel itself does not rub against the frame but uh, rubs up against the uh, the bearing. And then over here, this length is to be determined by, uh, you know, distances here and distances here and the thickness of the crank and all of that. So that's why I hold off on that. So now I'm going to set that up for soldering. Now, in order to solder, I need to take that uh, that die off of there. So I'll use a little thinner to take that off and again touch it up just a little bit with some emery cloth because remember only three things matter for soldering and they are cleanliness, cleanliness, oh and that's right, cleanliness. 
Now when you solder, do not use a great big torch like this. That's about useless. It just has way too much heat. So you need your, your micro torch, your tiny torch like this. But also remember that the brass will just suck the heat out of there as fast as you can put it in. And if you got this too close to the vise, you'll even have the, the vise uh, draw the heat out. And uh, that is uh, rather annoying. So use uh, some of this uh, rosin core or, or rosin rather, uh, paste. Do not use acid. Whatever you do, do not use acid because this is brass. It'll take the solder very nicely. And I uh, like to use 50-50 uh, solder and this is a small diameter. I like the small diameter because you don't get too much. And this is rosin core also, but uh, if you have plain wire that would be alright too. Sometimes I like to use for some jobs this really really small solder. That's just, well I don't know what it is, I gotta, I gotta read the label, but uh, that's probably kinda hard to find. But this size, which I believe is sixteenth, uh, sixty-two thousandths, yeah that's sixteenth, so that's easy to find. And generally it works better if you break off a piece, because you don't need much. You can see there's already some uh, rosin on there. Heat it up good. Now you don't need much solder. If it's running all over the place, it's not doing any good anyway. Did you see it run in? And that's all you need. It'll run clear around if the temperature is right. Now I'll do the other one off camera, the other side. I did several things off camera, but uh, take a look at the solder here up close. Pretty good job. There shouldn't be solder running all over. And uh, none came through. Sometimes a little will come through, but that was a pretty tight fit. Yeah, we got just a little bit showing right there. This is the first side that I did. Now when the material is all clean, that like this is, the solder will run all over the place if you use too much, even as it did there just a little bit. But we only want it to, to sweat into the joint. So you don't need very much solder. I mean it's just a tiny amount that you're using. Again, on the flywheel side, we got an eighth of an inch sticking out, and this is way too much, which, which will get sawed off later on. Now, I also made this little temporary wooden base, because otherwise it kind of rocks. that I cut out here for the flywheel, but uh, it'll come on and off this base several times, but that gives it a little stability here as I handle it and work with it. Off camera also, I uh, took the brass shaft, main shaft, and uh, it can be steel if you don't have it. I'm just trying to remain true to the name Yellow Boy. So this is the first time I've ever made the shaft out of out of brass. But I did take it to the mill and milled a little flat spot. Now the reason I do that, and you can grind that or file it, but it looks so much better if it's milled. But if you do not, and your set screw comes down and it always makes a burr or a mark, and then it's difficult to remove the, uh, the flywheel or, or whatever the appliance is off of the shaft. So uh, a flat really helps you a lot. And it goes on like this. And the shaft is also way too long and will be cut. Spins freely. Now next I believe I'll make the crank. Again, this is a half inch bore, three quarter stroke, which means that the crank pin will be three eighths off center. Here's a little related information for you if you can stand it, if not, speed it up. I know the kids at school didn't want to hear any related information, they wanted on with the show, but uh, this is a sheet metal vise or pattern maker, but mainly made for sheet metal work. And I had been wanting one of these for 45 years, and I finally got one, but I haven't had a time to clean it up. It's quite rusty, and I'm, I'm going to uh, paint it and, and kind of restore it, although it's not in bad shape. 
But uh, notice the difference between this vise and a standard bench vise. And this is a huge vise. I love this thing. It's uh, got about five or six inch jaws and it, uh, it'll open a long way too. And uh, weighs well over 100 pounds. But that, that's just a regular bench vise as compared to a sheet metal vise. Now this vise also will open up quite a long ways uh, compared to regular bench vises. Look at the length here. So you can see that this uh, is going to open probably eight inches. But you certainly wouldn't need that for sheet metal. You don't need any uh, uh, distance at all. But notice the jaws here. How high they are on a sheet metal vise. And many companies made these but you very rarely will see one. The jaws are smooth here. They are not serrated. So they don't put a mark on the wood or the sheet metal. And and uh, the whole idea here is, well, let me move the camera in to a slightly different angle. I'm sure that there won't be a single person in the 10,000 people that watch this that will have one of these vices. Uh, but it's uh, made by the Rock Island Manufacturing Company. It's, it's probably 100 years old because nobody would bother to go to the extra effort of uh, ornamenting the end of the screw like that, you know, and that in itself is pretty. And if you appreciate tools, you appreciate things like that, but it may not mean anything to some people. And uh, believe it or not, I only paid 20 bucks for that vise. It's pretty hard to find vices that cheap of any kind, let alone one that is rare. Look at the pretty ornamentation here, too. I enjoy looking at things like that as I work. And, uh, you know, nobody would bother doing something like that anymore. You know, everything is just uh, cheap and, and easy and, and uh, you know, didn't have any beauty to it. Now, I don't have this bench mounted to the table. It's not bolted to the table. It's just got a clamp on there for the moment. So I can't put much pressure on it. But, uh, again, I've got uh, the work, uh, if we're bending sheet metal, uh, into the vise. This is only uh, four and a half inches long, so it doesn't give you a lot of... Uh, of uh, latitude for bending something big. But you, you could simply hammer it down, but you're always, always going to get hammer marks. So what I would do typically is to put a board against there, and if the, if the material isn't too thick, bend it in that manner. I'm trying to give you alternatives now, again, to, uh, to bending. And that's the way you could do it, and that could be done in a regular vise as well. Then you check it with a square. It's not quite 90, so I'd put it back in. But the way these jaws are constructed, as opposed to the other orange vise here, you, you can go a little bit over 90 degrees. Like that. Not that we want to for this project, but I'm just showing you what this thing will allow you to do. So that is a sheet metal vise. When is the last time ever in your life you saw a vise that would open this wide? And uh, I'm a little over nine inches, and it probably could go another inch. So that would be used uh, for pattern making, uh, large pieces of wood. Look at the big face on the jaws here compared to uh, a regular machinist vise. A lot of rust on here, so I got to take that apart and clean it up. Now I'm a little worried on this bench here that uh, you know I got a hundred pound vise there, and I got a fifty pound vise here that's opened all that distance that my whole bench doesn't topple over. So I'm going to take this off right now uh, for safety purposes. That was just on there uh, to show you, and this is the first time that I have uh, done anything with this vise anyway because I bought this in the middle of winter, and this garage is unheated. And even though it's just about May, I've got a coat on, and it's, uh, it's only 50 degrees here in the garage in uh, northern Illinois, April 23rd, 2015. Back to the basement. I'm over at the closing lathe now, and I'm making this crank here. And uh, I'm using brass, of course, and this is about inch and a quarter brass, and I'm turning it down to inch and an eighth, and what that was, it was an old propeller shaft out of a boat. That was what held the propeller on, and that was tapered. Uh, Keith Fenner would like that. I don't know exactly what kind of brass it is, but it's cleaning up nice. 
So I've already drilled a, a hole in the end and reamed it 3 16 such that uh, the crankshaft will fit in there. And I'm going to hold that in with Loctite. And uh, after I clean it up here, I'm going to cut it off to about 3 16 thick. And I'm going to make about three of those because I'm going to need several of these for the different versions of this engine that I'm making. So first, turning it down to one and one eighth diameter. And that isn't too critical. You can get by with something a little smaller, perhaps even one inch, but it would be pushing it. I'm parting it off to 3 16 thick. You sure and use a sharp tool for this or it'll be trouble from the grass. 